thank you very much for coming. We have a very special guest for you today. Um, so just a little bit of background. Uh, Dr. Emilio Rabosa Gamboa was appointed by President Enrique Peña Nieto as consul in Boston, Massachusetts, assuming responsibilities from May 16, 2016 for all New England, um, New England but Connecticut is excluded. In the Mexican Foreign Service, he served as Mexico's permanent representative to the Organization of American States, or OA, OAS, since July 2013 to May 15, 2016 in Washington, D.C. In the public center, he has served in high office positions at the Home Office, the Social Security Institute, as well as a Human Rights Commission between 1998 and 2000. He was appointed by President, uh, the President of Mexico for peace negotiations in the Guerrilla conflict in the southern state of Chiapas. He has also done legal work in his own and firm academic and work academic work extensively. He is a professor researcher at the Institute of Legal Research at the National Autonomous University of Mexico, or as we like to call it, uh, La UNAM. He has taught law and politics at several private and public universities in Mexico and has given conferences in the United States, Canada, Europe, and Latin America. He holds a law degree from UNAM, a master's degree in political philosophy and political science from Cambridge University in England and has a Juris Doctor degree from UNAM. He, he is also the author of several books in law, and, in law and politics and editorials for several newspapers and magazines in Mexico. So for, without further ado, I give you Emilia, Emilia Rabosa. Thank you very much, uh, Gerardo. I am delighted to be here in Newbury College. Um, Gerardo told me about uh, at your service organization, and I think it is wonderful that um, you get together to discuss and analyze uh, different issues that's uh, going on in our world, in the United States, in Mexico, in other countries. Um, it is very, very important that uh, young people um, energy is, is uh, channelized through the uh, concerns of, of what's going on around us. And from that um, acquaintance with, with Gerardo, we, we um, uh, talked about the possibility of coming here to Newbury um, for, for a talk. At first it was um, scheduled for September. Why September? Because it is in September the date of our independence on the 15th of September and I uh, already accepted uh, an invitation by the president of Newbury College, Mr. Joseph Chilio, uh, to be here and, and talk about other things. But this other one came up because um, I think it is important to share with you uh, what's going on in Mexico and my country in the next uh, upcoming elections, the uh, 1st of July. Um, and why is it important? Because it is going to be, it is already being a momentous election. It's not a, um, another election, but a momentous election. A momentous election uh, from the quantitative point of view, because as we shall see, uh, we will never have as many as uh, all these candidates for federal positions and local positions um, uh, on, the, on the ballots that day and from the qualitative point of view because of uh, the new um, the scheme of um, independent candidates. For the first time in our history we are going to have non-party candidates participating in an election. One of them a woman um, although both of them had uh, grown within uh, different political parties, but they kind of broke, or if not broke, separated from them, became independent, and um, 
just upon the very recent constitutional reform, now they are allowed also to participate, not belonging to a party. And this is significant. Uh, parties are not very well regarded, I don't know, I don't think not only in Mexico, but throughout the world, you know, in, in different polls, um, in Mexico, the Latino barometer, uh, they, they, they uh, rank very, very low uh, in, in, in a scale, you know, where um, institutions like family, like church, or, or, or even um, army are, are highly ranked, but political parties you know, and, and legislators are, are very low ranking in that. So it's kind of the type of world we're living on, where, where also uh, uh, particularly youngsters are kind of getting fed up with the status quo of um, political parties and elections. So that brought to a, a important reform in Mexico just uh, a couple of years ago to allow for independent candidates. And this time we're going to have two. So this is another reason why this is a momentous election. Now, I, I would like to, since we only have like um, about uh, 40, 45 minutes, I would like to leave space for your questions. For me, it's very, very important to, to, to have your, your questions. So I'll try to um, speed up my presentation. So we we will have um, and, and do it in, in about uh, 25, 30 minutes, and, and then leave a space for questions from, from from you that I'd be delighted to to answer. And just as a quick uh, context, uh, I think it is important to, to visualize that um, Mexico, U.S. Well, that we have gone from different of different stages, but uh, different stages in our relations. That, uh, but in, in, in one direction, from war in the 19th century, where we lost almost half of, the, the, of our territory, all this portion was uh, part of Mexico in the 19th century, when Mexico became independent from Spain in 1812, and the, the war of so-called War of Texas, and um, also in beginning of the 20th century, and an invasion by President uh, Woodrow Wilson in, in Veracruz. So it was time of war, so therefore of strong separation, different of two countries uh, with the same border. But that evolved, that, that, that wasn't kept for a long time. Then um, during the 20th century, we went from war to distant neighbors, all right, with one fight, but we're distant neighbors. There, there you are, here I am. Uh, we'll visit each other sometimes. I'll take, uh, take my kids to Disneyland, uh, or Grand Canyon, and uh, you, you come and, and honeymoon in Acapulco. And, but that was almost uh, as, as far as, and start to do some uh, commerce no? um, between the two countries, but that was it. So there was a newspaper man from Brazil who was uh, from the New York Times, who wrote this book, uh, which I, if you're interested in the evolution of the relations of Mexico and the United States, I do recommend, became a classic called Distant Neighbors. So Alan Riding said in that book, um, it's so different from, from uh, historical cultural heritage. One from England, the other one from Spain, uh, one from a, a kind of um, philosophy that is so different from the other one, their history, their culture, their religion, uh, mostly one Protestant, the other one Catholic, um, everything is so different, so incredibly different, that it's distant neighbors. That was his conclusion. Well, they are neighbors, but they are distant neighbors. There's, uh, he didn't give too much possibility uh, on, on understanding each other, uh, less so living together. But he was wrong in that part. You know? Part of it was right of in his diagnostic, but part is wrong. Because that position evolved. It wasn't static. And evolved from distant neighbors to close neighbors. 
and not only close neighbors, but even partners. Partners in commerce, then it came something that you all know called NAFTA, and uh, we started to do things together. We started not only to exchange a lot of goods and services through the frontier um, between the two countries, but to build up and together with a third neighbor up Canada of chains of production, where uh, a part of a car was started in Canada, then it followed in the United States, and then maybe ended in Mexico, and then returned again to the United States for the final uh, parts. And then we suddenly saw that this was very, very important in terms not only of commerce, but in terms of competitiveness uh, towards other blocks in, in, in the global scene, uh, particularly the Asian Pacific Basin, uh, where China is, or the Europeans. And we discovered that in being partners, we were sum up and be a win-win situation that we developed products that were cheap and very competitive vis-a-vis -vis the products of the other blocks. So then we became good partners. And in being partners, there was also a wide flow of um, Mexicans to the United States. Also from the United States to Mexico, there is now living one million Americans in, in Mexico, but never as much as Mexicans to the United States. That was due to two, two factors, and this is something that uh, almost um, not, all, not everybody uh, uh, regards. It is true that uh, we had had a severe um, economic crisis uh, upon more or less the, the 70s or, or even before, um, but uh, that, that expelled manpower to up north. No, it is true, yes, but it is also true that this country was undergoing a huge transformation from a manufactured economy to a what is called economy of knowledge, uh, where technology, uh, where artificial um, uh, thinking was, is and is very important. And that transformation of the United States, as in other countries as well, from that type of economy to the other type of, of economy, required manpower that would do the jobs that the new generations didn't want to do, particularly in manufacture, for example, or in agriculture. I give you the example because it is part of my um, jurisdiction. I am Consul General in Massachusetts, Vermont, New England, uh, Maine, and New Hampshire. Uh, what's going on in Vermont? In Vermont, we have around 1,000 uh, men, ages 20 to 25, who work in milk farms. Now, why are there so many boys, uh, men, working in milk farms? Because the sons of the milk farmers don't care about milking cows. They want to go to universities, get a title, and then go and live in the cities. Vermont has one of the biggest shortage of young or youth uh, manpower. So those gaps, in order to keep such an important industry as the dairy industry, from which our uh, very good ice creams of Ben and Jerry come from, uh, rests on Mexican manpower. This is a, a, a very uh, clear example of why this migration took place. You know? Because it sometimes is said that it was because Mexico poverty, Mexico didn't have the response to the citizens. In part, yes, we hadn't had an economic system that could assimilate the poverty. Yes, it is part. But the, the other part of the story was the demand for this manpower. So now we have in the United States, throughout the United States, 35 million Mexican Americans. That's the population of Canada. Huge. Out of which 11 million are Mexicans. And the rest are people, descendants from Mexico who have born here. Now, this, this uh, population is a very active one. It's, it's hard working one. It produces 
240 billion dollars a year. He pays 90 billion dollars in taxes and consumes only 5 billion in public services. So it's now a different relationship. It's not only a commercial one, it's not only a relation about partnership, but it is also a, a relation about integration from two societies, from two countries that Alan Riding thought they would never be able to live together. Well, so now we have 35 million living here and 1 million living here, so he was wrong. All right, enough for the context. Let's now move to the theme of, my, of this conference because I've already spent like 10 minutes. About this, um, why is this a momentous election? First of all, let me tell you that we have one of the most um, uh, sort of uh, uh, complicated electoral system. Um, it, 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 uh, somebody in, in a conference in Harvard just about a month ago said it's a, like a baroque system. Why? For many years, having a almost, not never one, but almost one party system or a quasi hegemonic uh, party system, which lasted for many years, in a country that never had democratic experience, but just some shots in the, in the 19th century, who came out from first the uh, rule of, of, of the kings during pre-Hispanic times, then the rule of the viceroys uh, in three centuries of colonial uh, rule. It was a one-man rule tradition. The 19th century, all these revolutions, uh, coups, etc., to try to fix up a former government to the nation, new uh, nation, was very, very difficult. But there wasn't kind of a democratic tradition. When we really wanted to, to, to inaugurate democracy at the beginning of the 20th century with the election of Francisco Madero after the fall of the dictator Porfirio Diaz, he was shot. He was, uh, he was the first elected president through ballots and he was shot less than or almost a year after taking office and there was a coup de stat. So once again, democracy went away. And we built up a uh, highly centralized political system, not exactly Cuba, which is now, I heard in the news, handling the Castro era to a new man. Yes, but a new man picked up by the Castros and uh, who will be uh, monitored by the, 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 the Castro. So we had a, a very centralized regime, not as centralized as, as the Cuban one, which lasted for about 70 years. It gave political um, equilibrium and social peace to the country, yes. If compared to the rest of Latin America, where there were coups and revolutions and, and uh, all, all kinds of, of upheavals, Mexico did not. But still, no democratic tradition. So to jump from a history of no democracy to 100% democracy, that was a huge, huge jump and a huge undertaking. It wasn't easy. There was a lot of mistrust. This is why the reason we built this kind of baroque system, but a democracy. The main characteristic is that we mixed two principles that you don't have in your system. The majority principle, he or she who gets more votes wins and that's it. Even if she got something like 50.1% uh, and the one who got 49.9, sorry, lost out with uh, a principle that's called proportional representation that came from Europe. This principle says, hey, wait a moment, that one got 49.9, that's a lot. That's a lot. I mean, if you divide the voting among three or four candidates, 
the one who gets most by the majority principle couldn't as, uh, get more than like 25, 30 percent, which is a minority as compared to the rest of them. So we have to take into account all the rest. And that's how the other principle was established. Proportional representation. That is, in proportion to the votes you get, you have X number of seats in both chambers. So the two principles mixed together. In which way? There are, in the House of Representatives, 300 elected by the majority principle, one who gets even by half, by one vote, wins, and that's it. The other one loses, and 200 by proportional representation. And that also went to the, to the Senate. So this is a mixed system that we're talking about. Okay? Now, um, biggest election in history. Uh, we are having as much as 3,406. Uh, uh, seats uh, to be decided on 1st of July. Look at the jump from the past presidential election, which was in 2012. There were 2,127. Now it's almost 1,200 more. And uh, the jump from the middle term election of 2015. We have always six, time, six terms elections. Presidential cannot be re-elected, never, but now legislators can be re-elected, and we have midterm elections. So we are going to have election of president, 500 representatives by both principles, 128 senators by both principles, nine governors out of 32, nine governors, 1,596 town halls, 972 other local representatives, the, the governor of Mexico City, the capital, 16 mayors in Mexico City, and 184 other local positions. Huge. Someone asked me last time, how did this happen? Why does jump from here to here? Is it because there were mo more um, positions in, in, the, in the political arena? No, it's because they decided through a reform or uh, two or three uh, years ago to make uh, as many as um, elections concurrent at the same time, federal and local. Before there was no election of governors the same day of the election of the president. Now we have nine governors. So they made it this way. Why did they make it this way? Because they reasoned uh, saying, well, uh, I think we are tiring the electorate with so many elections, the federal one, the local, the municipal. They are really tired about elections and campaigns. So let's bring them together and let's just have one period of election. And that's it. This is why it rose from here to here. But that's a lot of decisions to be decided in one day. Okay? Now, we, are gonna ha we have a voter list of 86 million people which is huge, 156,000 voting stations that will be open throughout the country. There is no electronic voting. It's um, uh, by hand. You get your ballot, you go into a small box, so you are not seen. It, the vote is secret. You cross and you go and put it in the ballot box. 900, almost a million citizens will be polling officials in this 156,000. The interesting thing about this figure is that those citizens are chosen by the neighbors. So the Electoral Institute, one of our, of our central pillars of this system, trained this huge army of citizens by selecting them from neighbors. So what is going to happen? That if you go to your voting station, which has to be close to your home address, whom will you see sitting as polling official? Your neighbors. So you'll know them, and they will know you. So that makes it an extra trusted uh, element for the election. And almost 3 million party representatives in each of these voting stations 
each party, and there are going to be nine plus two independents, can appoint a representative in the table to be observing the, that election is done properly and that there is no hanky-panky or any kind of irregularity. Something about this 86 million, that includes citizens abroad. All the consulate networks in the United States and throughout the world, in the United States it's only, there's 50, is the biggest consular network in the world, open for registration for citizens who wanted to vote. The, the vote of Mexican living abroad is also a very recent um, phenomenon. It didn't happen before, but now they opened the system to include also Mexicans living abroad. So if you wanted to vote, you would go to the consulate, fill up a form that was sent to the uh, National Electoral Institute, I'll, sp I'll speak about that in a moment, and then they would send you directly your voting credential. I have a uh, kind of a, uh, like this, they will be sent to your address directly, and with the data from here, you go into the web, and you register, and then they will send to your address, to your home, an envelope with the ballots for president and, in some cases, for governor, which are the ones that you are entitled to vote for. You can pass it a, a, around, please. This is how we register. So far, the network has registered 100,000 people throughout the world, mainly like 85, almost 90 percent in the United States, who will be casting votes in this election. You might say, oh well, out of 86 million, uh, let's assume that only go to the pool something between 60 or 70 percent, 100,000 is not that much. Well, it is. First of all, 12 years ago when we first established this um, uh, this model of voting abroad, there was only 30,000 30, registered. Six years ago, 40,000, and now 100,000, more than double, which shows the interest in this election. And believe me, in a very tight um, end results election, those votes can be decisive. When President Calderon won, he only won by 0 0.45, like 240,000 votes. It was a very, very close election. So the votes from the Mexican living abroad, believe me, they count, and they count a lot. Okay, now let's move to the, um, uh, well, this is participation, more or less the estimate of, of participation in, in, in the elections um, by, by age, um, in the middle term and, and the other ones. I won't, st I won't stop uh, very much, but you can see that who mostly vote are people between 30s and 70s. Now, only these people here, 18 to 20, which is there, they, they could be decisive this time. John could go and decide, decide, because the vote is so spread among these ages that these ages, if they go out and vote, they could decide the election. We are talking about a huge percentage of the electorate. Almost 17, 17 million people. Now, so this electoral system was built since 1977 through 2018. We have been doing electoral engineering for the past 30 years. When I say we, it hasn't been the result of one entity, one group, or the government. No, it has been the government political parties, civil society, academia, NGOs, individuals, we have all participated in this engineering through uh, whatever, meetings, rallies, uh, manifestations, public uh, get gatherings, etc., polls, etc., etc. It hasn't been the product of one or a small group of people. It has been a product of a country. 
the electoral engineering through six constitutional reports, which is the result of that engineering. The result of that engineering is um, the, what I call the three pillars of wisdom. Next, please. These are the main institutions that will be facing this momentous election. The column is the National Electoral Institute. This is an institution that is headed by 11 citizens appointed by the House of Representatives. No government intervention in this. No. Before, it was the Ministry of Interior who presided over this committee. Not anymore. Now it's only citizens who organize the election. What do they do? They prepare, they organize, and they conduct the federal election. They train the people in the voting polls. They um, monitor the expenses of the parties. There is a, a ceiling out of which you cannot spend more money because you are getting in 80%, 85% public funds. Only private funds are allowed in like 10, 15%, that's it. No? Um, they also supervise and monitor the time the political parties have um, a space in media, whether radio, whether TV. That is also being um, monitored by the Electoral Institute. So everyone has the same times. So there is no party that has like 80% of the time of TV, and the others have just a little 20%. No, it has to be distributed equally among the, uh, all, all the political parties. Then we have a court, a special court to decide on the controversies that arise from this election. If someone is not happy because his, his party or her party didn't register as a member, he or she can go to the court and make present a claim against his or her party. But most important, once elections are done, of course, the loser will never be happy as any other as any loser would, uh, uh, could be. So they think, uh, yes, I lost, but I didn't lose in a fair uh, and equal election. Then I go to the tribunal, and the tribunal revises. Uh, accepts evidence and makes a resolution. Yes, the election is confirmed, or no, the election is not confirmed, and you have to go to a new election, or even, no, it's not this that won, but that that won, and that's final. No one else can revise this decision. This has provided Mexico with a great deal of social and political stability. Why? Because Without having this, and also magistrate, citizens, magistrates appointed by the Senate, every time one had a discontent with the results, they would go to the street to protest, to pressure upon the authorities. Now there is a tribunal that takes care of this, and the resolutions are final. And so far, since the last 20 years that we've had this tribunal, no resolution has been uncontested. They are all being accepted and enforced. Of course, the loser will never be happy. But one thing is, I'm not happy, and I'm, a different thing is, I'll go to the streets and, and protest against this. They accept. And finally, a special prosecutor office for the attention of electoral crimes. Any type of fraud, any type of illegal intervention, hey, Someone sponsored the Russians here. No, mm -hmm. uh, it's immediately in the get investigated by the uh, um, special prosecutor's office. They do a, 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 a an investigation with with evidence. They were appointed by the Senate, and then they come to a decision. Yes, this. He or she, or this group, or this institution, are criminals. They shouldn't have done what they did, and they are put to jail. Okay? So these are the main institutions of this new system. Now, 
Rápido, muévele porque ya por así. So, what assures electron integrity in the model? First of all, we have an electoral system which is autonomous. Autonomous from what? From the government, from the business, from the church, from any other uh, living political, economic, or social force in Mexico. It is, it, it is armored in such a way that it is impossible for any of these forces to determine the, the, um, the sense of the voting. If we have political parties who are engaged in, in this process and a lot of civil society or participation, then we have an effective democracy. An effective democracy of free, reliable, and transparent elections that has given the country social and political stability and that allows to power shift at all levels of government. It started in the municipal level first, then it went into the state level governors, and now it has even gone to the presidential level. We have already had a shift from the PRI to the PAN, and now back to the PAN to the, P, to the PRI. So, and this has happened without violence, which in a country of non-democratic tradition is very important. Okay, now, um, the stages of the, the electoral timetable, we are now in this stage. The first one was from December to February, uh, where they sort of uh, organized, not exactly primaries, kind of procedures to select the candidates for every level. This was done in this period. Once they selected them, each party by its own methods, um, then there was registration. In registration, something very important. We introduced a 50% woman, 50% men. Gender equality. No country will get a register to participate in an election if 50% of its candidates are not women. And 50% of the candidates are, uh, are men. 50, 50, this is electoral equality. So in the chambers, you'll get, if it, one is uh, 500, around 250 women and 250 men. And in the Senate, 128, 64, and 64. It is to bring, it's a, it's a gender quota to, to assure to assure equality of gender in the, um, in the houses of, of parliament. This is very, very, very important. It has made a great qualitative change to have now so many women in Congress. Some political parties started to argue when the, when the reform uh, was coming, oh, we will never find enough women to be uh, candidates. Oh, they, they are uh, doing domestic work or, no. It's not true, they've already, and we have now a very strong women participation in Congress. So we are now here, March 30 to June 27, campaign, 60 days, three months. We are in the first month where we'll be having debates. The first debate this coming Sunday will be at 8 o'clock, and there are going to be three debates. Then the election day, the 1st of July, and then post electoral come down on electoral uh, claims to the tribunal. Rapido, uh, who are the ta main candidates? We've got nine political parties, out of which three, Morena, PRI, and PAN, are the main ones, the most strong ones. But now they came into coalitions, into alliance. So Morena allied with PT and PT and Encuentro Social, PRI with the Verde, which is the, the um, ambientalist uh, party, Alianza, PAN with a previous very strong opponent, the PRD, PAN right, PRD left, now they gather together. This is very interesting. You know? For example, it was the PRD who was able to um, produce and pass uh, legislation to allow gay marriage, to allow uh, abortion, uh, to allow adoption by same-sex people. Strongly opposed by the PAN. Strongly, strongly opposed by the PAN and the church. And now they are together. Mm -hmm. This is another novelty. No? Yeah. Yeah. 
how if, if, if this one if this coalition wins and these issues arise, how are they going to solve us to solve it? Question mark. Because they were profound, profound enemies when when the, the bill was discussed in, 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 in Congress. Well now they are allies on this third one. So we have three main candidates, Mr. Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, Mr. Jose Antonio Mircuri Breña, uh, five times Secretary of State in the last, in, uh, Minister in the last uh, 20 years, Mr. Ricardo Anaya, the youngest of the two. But we also have two candidates, independent, a woman, Margarita Zavala, uh, wife to former President Calderón, uh, a long-time PAN member, and Jaime Rodriguez Calderón, uh, just governor of Nuevo León, El Bronco. Now, you might say, well, have they got a chance? Very little, but let's remember, this man won some years ago the governorship as independent. He defeated the parties in his home state. He won the election, and that's how he became governor of Nuevo León, a very important and industrial and huge state and rich state. So he is now motivated to participate as independent in the presidential race. So we have two plus three, we have five candidates in the electoral ballot, which will be distributed the 1st of July. Um, well, this is just what will happen in the election day. The polls will open at 8 a.m. You have to show your ID, that uh, ID that I just passed by. Um, but if you don't have that, you cannot vote. Even if you are registered in the list of, your, of, of where your home is, if you don't have that credential, you cannot vote. Your name might be on the list, but if you don't have the credential, you cannot vote. You have to have this credential. They'll give you the ballots, no, three for federal, President, Senate, House of Representatives. Three for local, Governor, um, the, the, the local Congress, and uh, municipals. Uh, or in the case of Mexico City, Governor of Mexico City, uh, even, even one or more delegate, and the uh, legislative body. So in case of Mexico City, there's going to be seven ballots that will be handed over to the uh, voter will go and cross his preferences and cast the votes. He'll have, he or she will have his fingerprint as ID, so they, she or he cannot vote again in another uh, voting poll, and then their voting count will start. The INE, this um, central column that I mentioned before, will be in permanent session throughout the day, monitoring the election, attending all sorts of problems, irregularities, etc. And there will be national and international observers from the United Nations, from the OAS, from, I don't know if this time, the, the uh, Jimmy Carter uh, uh, organization, etc., etc., etc. It is an open, a transparent election. There is no way that fraud could happen in, in front of so many eyes of so many people involved. Okay? So, um, well, these are the, the characteristics. Uh, this, I, I already talked about this, the, the, the procedure to register to vote for people who live abroad, so I won't stop in this anymore. And now, uh, election results. There are several systems Again, no, the kind of baroque that will give the results. As different from here, where in the, the night of the election you turn on your TV and whatever CNN or Fox News or whatever said, well, that was it, right? And people believe what the TV chains would say or the channels. No, no, no. no. Here, the last word is on the president of the INE. The president of the INE at around 11 o'clock at night on the day of the, election, of the election will come out and say, according to a quick counting, I'll, I'll just explain that in a moment, we have the following results. He cannot say the winner is, 
No. He said, the leading candidate so far according to this is such. And this is the second, and this is the third. Because this is based on quick counting. Quick counting is a method from which they previously selected um, ballot uh, boxes sites throughout the country, and they will send like a very significant sample uh, of, of to cover like 10, 15 percent, and from there they'll get the information and send it to the central offices in Mexico City. This is what is called quick counting because it is counted just in the moment the uh, ballot box is closed at 6 p.m. Some will be closed later because if there is people standing, you have to respect whatever time it takes to have every citizen to vote. But mostly it's around 6 o'clock. So by 6 o'clock, they would start counting the, the votes in, in the boxes, separating them in case one got mixed up for Senate in the House of Representatives, box of President, etc. And they will take more or less around the officials around an hour to say, all right, and so then when they are separated, they count how many? Only for president at, the, at that moment. Only for president. There will be no results in, at 11 o'clock for other positions. Only for president. And they fill up a, a, a form, a, an act, and then send, give it to this man from the INE, and then he sends it by iPhone or whatever, or takes a picture and sends it to the central office, and that's how they will get the results for this quick counting at the election night. And that is how the president of INE will declare who is so far the leading figure. If, if there might be, as it was in one election, almost a tie, what is called technical tie between two candidates, that the difference is very insignificant, he would say so. But he has to say who is, even by 0 0.000009, he has to say who is the leading uh, candidate at that moment. He cannot come with, oh well, we don't know because it's so tight that we have to wait for the preliminary polling system. Once this has uh, started, then this other one started, which is each president of each a voting poll will be sending the results and then they are put into a computer and it's accumulated and everyone can see it through internet, through TV, etc. They will be going on for the rest of the night you know, and, and the next day. Then you have the counting by district, 300 districts at local level and sent then to the unit with the presence of national and international observers. I take in so much. This is, so far, this is the, the ID, and I'll leave it here so I can take questions. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Speaking of the integrity of the election, what is the composition of uh, the INEC? You know, is it who appoints the members? You say citizens. The members of what? Uh, INEC. INEC? INEC, yeah. Uh, it's uh, 11. 11. Appointed by anyone who wants to be a, a member of that uh, committee can present its own candidates. If, for example, I say, oh, I'd like to be sitting there. No? So you can imagine there are many, many, many applications. No? From them, a, from, let's say there are like 200 and there's only 11 seats. No? From then, at the INE, they revise them with the presence of political parties, and they say, no, this is unfit. This, is, this uh, has bad, bad precedence. This, uh, whatever. They come to a close number, and then when they say, I don't know the exact figure, but it could be like, I don't know, maybe 30, then they send it to the House of Representatives, and then they vote, um, cast a vote uh, in a box, the representatives is the House of Representatives who elects them in this way. That goes back to you talked about Momento's election because independence candidates are going to contest this time around. But I'm trying to say I don't want to underestimate the power of the incumbency, you know, the government party, you know. 
they might they have their apparatus <coughs> security to do a lot of things that independent candidates might not have the opportunity, like uh, government candidates, you know. The government doesn't have any possibility to intervene in the in the election or the election results at all. If it did, it would cause such an uproar that it it, it would really be a, 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 a terrible mess and a very difficult political uh, situation. There is no possibility that, that, that the government could allow. Now, another thing is that the independent candidates compared to the party candidates are weaker, yes. Yes, because they don't have the party apparatus in each state that the others do. No, they are by their own. They, they, they might have uh, organized a small group of friends or families um, or whatever, but uh, they are on their own. They don't have the machinery that the political parties have in, in each of the 32 states. So in that sense, yes, they, they are not in exactly equal terms. No. But they do get uh, public funding, they do get um, the same amount of uh, time in, in media, they will be in the debate, and in the debate they will give them exactly the same time as the others. Yes? Is this system based originally on the Constitution of 1917, the Mexican Constitution, uh, is, and it's been sort of tweaked from there on, or is this an entirely different constitutional system? That's question number one. Question number two is, um, you know, that's really for a point of clarification in my own teaching when I teach, you know, I do, I only really know, I'm a U.S. historian by training. Uh, but uh, the second question I had is kind of what Tony was uh, talking about, the status of parties in relation to the Constitution itself, to the operation of the government itself, because in the United States, the U.S. Constitution, parties have absolutely no status, official government status whatsoever. Um, they, um, in a matter of fact, if you read the Federalist Papers, the Founding Fathers said parties would be terrible for the system, so, you know, but I was wondering with the 70 year history of the dominance by the PRI, um, it sounds like to me uh, that parties actually do have some sort of official constitutional status, and, cause, and, and partly also because you say it is a really huge deal that all of a sudden, you know, these independent candidates are doing far better than they ever had before. So my question really, the second question is, um, do parties have an official kind of status within the constitutional system? Probably, I would assume probably yes, because of that 70 year history of the PRI, the one party dominance. Okay. Regresate a la termina donde dice las seis reformas electorales. I'm glad you asked that question, Professor, and I would be glad to send you mm -hmm. a, a copy. It's a very, very, very small book mm -hmm. uh, that I wrote oh. explaining all the main six constitutional reforms that we did since the 70s to come to the system. Right. Uh, almost every uh, six years, every sexenio, every new administration, mm -hmm. uh, the president took it as its um, kind of a personal uh, mark to, to give a step forward. Mm -hmm. you know? And before we only started with House of Representatives mm -hmm. for the mixed system, mm -hmm. but Senate, no. Mm -hmm. Senate uh, uh, kept as um, principle of majority. Mm -hmm. So we had to go through six constitutional reforms in the Constitution of 1917, starting in 1979, when these electoral system was brought to the Constitution. Mm -hmm. It is constitutionally based. Okay. No? You cannot, therefore, change it so easily as if it was only in a law. Mm -hmm. It is in the Constitution. There, is spe uh, specific, uh, uh, there are several articles that establish the mixed system, the 300, the 200, how they will be elected, for how long, how will the representatives of the INE be uh, mm -hmm. appointed, by whom, everything in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. And then there is the federal law mm -hmm. that takes the constitutional um, norms to a different level. Mm -hmm. This is, uh, has been object of many modifications by political parties in Congress, mm -hmm. no? but yes, it is framed in the Constitution. Political parties are constitutionally based. There is a, an article that established that political parties are entities of public interest to engage the citizenship 
in the elections. No? And it is that definition, which I think it was a very intelligent one, that um, from it derived a set of responsibilities to political parties. Mm -hmm. If you are an entity, so the Constitution says, of public interest, then you have to be accountable. Mm -hmm. You have to, to tell us how much are you spending on what, how, etc. You have to respond about the timing you are using in TV, in radio, etc. You have to respond for the whatever felony of any of your of your members. Oh yes, everything is established in the Constitution. So I'd be glad to send you a copy of my book. It is called um, The Constitutional Reforms in, Elect in Political Electoral and it is written in Spanish and English. When I wrote it in Spanish, United Nations um, liked it so much. It is, I think, the only book that accounts for these reforms. It tells you exactly what each reform was aimed for, what was changed, involved, etc. I'm missing two of the latest because by that time when I edited it, they, they hadn't happened. And the United Nations uh, was very generous to finance the English translation. Mm -hmm. So it's a Spanish English. So I'll send you a copy if no, you're interested in, in English. In the United States, the media is very involved with the election. Like, in, and you mentioned that in Mexico, the media is not really portrayed as it is here. So, does it have, if, if I don't know, does it have any, um, does the media have any influence over the election? Oh, no, yes, but when I say that as different from here, uh, it is not the media that on the night of elections provide the results, and everyone believes what the media uh, says, mm -hmm. but that there is a, an official um, who will say who the winner uh, so far has been, as different from here. That doesn't mean that the media don't have a very, a very important role in the election throughout the different stages. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, they've already been doing many things. They, are, they have their own polls, which they present, like uh, um, Televisa or uh, TV Azteca, they have their own polls, they present. They produce a lot of um, analysis and debate tables with specialists. No? For example, there was one very interesting, just yesterday I was seeing, um, prior to the debate for Sunday, which called up, up, upon three strategists um, of, 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 of public... Uh, the relations of medias and said, what would you advise this candidate to do on the debate? What would you about do advise this other one to do or not do in the debate? Oh no, they are extremely active. The media, radios, TVs, they keep searching the candidates to do interviews, you know, and uh, they, they confront the, the, what one candidate says to the other one. Every day we have, oh, this candidate say this, about the new airport, no, uh, the, the biggest, biggest uh, project now building in Mexico City, not to be one of the biggest airports in, in the world, now is being contested by Mr. López Obrador. So they confront the candidates' views. Oh no, they have a huge role. The only thing they don't have, although they will also give their own results, that doesn't mean that they cannot do it on the night of the election, they will come out and say, according to my polls, according to my, uh, this one won. But no one, no one would believe that that's it. No, they all be expected for the president of the INE to come out between 11 and 12 and say, this is the stand so far of the election based on that procedure. And the second part of the question, how involved are your youths, the young ones? First of all, they are kind of disillusioned. Too many promises, too little done. No, you said you would do this uh, when I voted for you uh, five years ago, and you haven't done that. No, you said you will. Let me give you an example that you will fight corruption. 
this and this and that have been pointed out as corrupt members. So they are kind of disillusioned. Uh, there is also kind of disillusionment out of central problems, mainly three. This election is going to be about three issues. Poverty, 50% of the population living in still in poverty, out of which 50% is living in extreme poverty. In, in, in a population of 120 million uh, persons, neighbor to the United States. So it's huge. Second, violence. See, a, 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 the death toll is enormous. Now, but now, in this point I want to be very clear, and I always say uh, this, this is a very unjust war that we are fighting, because we didn't produce it. It is the, the drugs war between the lords themselves, you know, who take as hostage citizens, you know, uh, to, for a vengeance, for whatever. You know. And why I say this is an unjust uh, war? Because it's a, a war that is produced by a demand that comes from here, and a supply that comes from the south. We are a transit. We neither produce, I mean, we, we might produce, but never in the quantities that are exported, nor that we consume in the quantities that are consumed in this, uh, in this, in this country. So we are in the middle, but we are putting the day. But it is a lot of violence. It is a lot of violence. There, there hasn't been a, a solution to stop it. We, of course, were able to capture a very important stronghold, among them a chapel, who was uh, sent here to the United States, the biggest uh, drug lord. But still, violence is everywhere. And, and that has uh, disillusioned many people. And then there is corruption. And, and these things being kept from, from administration to administration and political parties offering solutions that then they do not make, that has the solution, particularly the young. That's what I particularly the young. They're going to participate. The young. No. So the, the young. young, the reaction is either, okay, I don't care about it, I don't want to participate, or I want to participate in this way as different from the other elections. Okay? So, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you very much.